Good morning everyone. I am Dr. Deepak Patkar and I will be talking on MR anatomy of lumbar spine. The role of MRI in spinal imaging is very well known to all of us. It has revolutionized the way we image spine. It is gold standard in imaging of most of the spinal pathologies which include degenerative disc disorders, spinal infections, tumors of the spine and few situations when we are imaging spine for trauma. Understanding the anatomy is of immense importance because it allows understanding of the pathologies as well as normal variants that we look for. It makes minimally invasive interventions and surgery is possible because of the details that it provides to the spinal surgeon. These are current American College of Radiology, ASNR and SCBT guidelines for which sequences need to be performed for degenerative disc disorders. For example, in the cervical spine, the T1s and T2s are obtained with a slice thickness of 3 mm and gap of 1 mm. In thoracic and lumbar spine, the slice thickness is 4 mm. So broadly, when we do cervical, dorsal or lumbar spine MRI for degenerative disc disorders, we obtain 3 or 4 mm sagittal T1 weighted images, 3 or 4 mm sagittal T2 weighted images, axial T1 and axial T2 in the dorsal and lumbar spine are again 4 mm each. In the cervical spine, axial T1 is 3 mm, axial T2 are by and large replaced by a 3D sequence which gives you anything between 1 to 1.5 mm thin cuts through the discs. Coronal stir sequence or any other fat set sequence is of the thickness of 3 or 4 mm. Again, it gives you intricate details about the marrow edema which is associated with degenerative disc disorders. A lot of people also obtain sagittal and coronal myelogram pictures which are heavily titubated sequences and they take about 3 to 4 seconds of time these days. It's again a heavily titubated sequence. As I said, axial gradient replaces axial T2 in the cervical spine. A lot of people who have undergone wide lamentomies, they suffer from post-operative listhesis which is best seen in flexion and extension studies. So a fast T2 sequence in flexion and extension in addition to neutral position is also useful in post-operative spine at the atlantoaxial junction when you are looking for atlantoaxial stability, instability or subluxations. A flexion extension in dynamic mode is a necessity. Again, the slice thickness there is 3 to 4 mm. Post contrast study is necessary in post operative spine where you are looking for epidural fibrosis or arachnoiditis, and in the immediate post op period, you are looking for hematoma, abscess, or discitis osteomyelitis. In that situation, post contrast fat set T1 with a slice thickness of 3 or 4 mm necessary. You must also remember a relatively new concept of what is called as physiological imaging where you require fat suppressed MR imaging techniques pre or post contrast. If it is pre contrast, you require to do fat sac T2. If it is post contrast, it is fat sac T1. This is again required to look at edema which is associated with localized pain. Last decade, there was a lot of emphasis on wet bearing or axial loading imaging where there was reverse pressure on the vertebrae and disc to look for small discs which would show up only with load bearing which are typically seen when patient is standing. This is now going out of fashion. Some people also use nuclear bone scintigraphy to look for edema or when you have multiple multi-level disc disorders if you are looking for which disc is responsible for the pain, nucleus scintigraphy is quite useful. Before we go on to lumbar spinal MRI anatomy, 
we looked at X-ray and a bone as to how vertebra looks. So this is top view and side view of dried bone of a vertebral body L4. So this is vertebral body, this is pedicle, this is transverse process, this is mammillary process, lamina, spinous process and this is spinal canal. From side view you can see superior and inferior articular facets very well. So this is inferior articular facet of this L4 vertebra. This is superior articular facet of the same vertebra. Here it is well seen. So this is superior articular facet of L4. This is inferior articular facet of L3. This is pedicle. This is transverse process. This is lamina. This is spinous process. And this is the area of pars which gets broken in lysis as is seen here. Coming to normal anatomy on sagittal T1 and T2 images. This is vertebral body. Marrow is relatively bright in adults. This is the cortex of the superior end plate. This is the cortex of inferior end plate which merges with annulus fibrosis of the adjoining disc. This is nucleus bulbosus which contains about 85% water so it's dark on T1 and bright on T2. Annulus fibrosis contains complete fibrous tissue so it's dark on T1 and T2 both. In younger children and younger adults you see a cleft which is embryological in origin in the center of normally bright nucleus bulbosus which is a paste like material. What we see here are the central veins in the vertebral body which drain the blood from the marrow of the vertebrae. Because of slow flow, they appear bright on T2. So again, this is vertebral body, the cortex of the end plate, nucleus pulphosis, annulus fibrosis. This is conus medullaris, seen here again on T2 also. This is the CSF in the thecal sac which is dark on T1 and bright on T2. This is spinous process. This is the anterior cortex of the spinous process. This is the posterior cortex of the spinous process. When you measure the spinal canal, you have to measure it from the posterior cortical margin of the vertebral body. Make it parallel to the orientation of the vertebral body and draw it till the anterior most margin of the spinous process. Normal dimension in the cervical spine is between 9 and 11. In the lumbar spine, the lower cutoff is 12. 10 to 12 is borderline canal stenosis and less than 10 is definite spinal canal stenosis. This dark posterior line that you see is the dura or the posterior margin of the thecal sac. These linear grayish things that you are seeing within the CSF of the thecal sac are the corda equina nerve roots, again conus medullaris here. This is a parasagetal image. This is typically about third or fourth slice from the midline. What we see here is what in body, pedicle, superior articular process inferior articular process which is actually better seen here. This keyhole like thing is the neural foramen through which the insulting nerve root is coming out. We are going to talk about that in details a little later. This is pars interarticularis which is the neck of the Scotty dog and here if you see it is broken. So this patient has spondylolysis of L5 vertebra without lysthesis. Besides the existing nerve roots, there are two or three small dots which are seen adjoining the existing nerve root. So basically these are venous plexuses which join the paravertebral plexus of Batson's with the epidural system. These are axial images, again L45 disc, T1 and T2. On T2, the central bright portion of the disc is nucleus purposes.
the peripheral dark portion is annulus fibrosus and also averaging of superior or inferior cortical margin or enclave of the upper or lower vertebral body. These are psoas muscles. This is superior articular facet or superior articular process of L5. This is inferior articular facet or inferior articular process of L4. This C-shaped thing is the cortex covering the superior articular facet of L5. This is the cortex of inferior articular facet of L4. In between, the gray thing that you are seeing is the fluid and cartilage within the facet joint. This is the diarthrodial joint like knee, shoulder or hip joint. This white thing is the thecal sac. The dots within the bright thing for the thecal sac are the nerve roots of the caudaic bone. This whitish thing coming out on P1 and P2 both are the neural foramina. What we see here is the posterior epidural fat. This grey flap like thing on both T1 and T2 is ligamentum flavum. This is the thecal sac, psoas muscles. These are erectus spinae and caudatus lumborum muscles. This is the traversing nerve root. So at L4-5 this level you have L5 as the traversing nerve root and L4 as the exiting nerve root. Coming back to parasagittal pictures, you have pars which is quite dark and intact over here. Pars, you have crust of the diaphragm and I will see anterior to the vertebral column. This is posterior epidural fat. This person's canal is quite wide. So there is abundant posterior and anterior epidural fat. This is thecal sac. No roots of the cord icona. This is the codus. Again to revise at the foraminal level, you have keyhole like appearance. So through L4-5 neural foramen, L4 no root will come out. Through L3-4 neural foramen, L3 no root will come out. This is one section further lateral to this section which shows inferior articular facet of L4 and superior articular facet of L5 joined to form L4-5 facet joint which is the grey thing between the cortex of superior and inferior articular facet. Looking at pedicular and foraminal level, at pedicular level you have vertebral body, this is L4 vertebra again. Pedicle, transverse process, mammillary process. This is part of superior articular facet of L4. This is part of inferior articular facet of L3. This is the spinous process, thecal sac. These are the traversing nerve roots. So at L4 5 level or L4 vertebral level, these are L5 nerve roots. At foraminal level, again at L4 5, you have thecal sac, spinous process, lamina dorsal nerve root ganglion which we are going to talk a little later and these are the veins communicating the paravertebral venous process of vaccines and epidural veins. This is again at L4-5 this level, nucleus pulp process, annulus fibrosus which is dark, this is thicker sac, superior articular facet of L5, inferior articular facet of L4, ligamentum flavum, facet joint, posterior epidural fat, this is the neural foramen, L4 nerve root which is exiting, this is L5 nerve root which is traversing, this is aorta, this is crust of death. A little bit about lateral assess, when we talk about lateral assess stenosis quite often. So this is the distance between the posterior aspect of the said vertebral bodies, so it's L4 here, and superior articular facet of L5. This distance is measured just outside the margin of the thecal sac at the level of undersurface of pedicle. Anything less than 4 millimeters at this juncture is abnormal. When you have diameter of 2 or 3 millimeters will be called as lateral stenosis. 4 or more normal. Repeating the concept of exiting and traversing nerve roots. 
So at info file level, you have info file disk nucleus one process, info file disks annulus file process, pickle sack, superior articular facet of L5, inferior articular facet of L4, facet joint, become the flavor. This is the traversing node So at L4 file level, L5 is the traversing node this is the exiting the root, so it's L4 at L4 file disk level. Importance of this is described a little later when we talk about herniations of disks at different locations. A little bit about dorsal root ganglion. As the nerves exit at the foramen level, you get slight least shoulder appearance of those exiting the roots. So these are not only really stolen neurons, but these are dorsal neuro ganglia. They can be as small as this, they can be as thick or big as this, and this should not be mistaken for sequestered disc fragment. A little bit about anterior and posterior nerve ligaments. Typically they get merged with the cortex of the vertebral body and annulus of the discs. So here this yellow arrow shows you anterior ligament extending across entire lumbar vertebral column. The amber colored arrow shows posterior ligament going across the entire lumbar vertebral column. So they start from C1 and C2 level respectively and go up to sacrum. When you have osteophytes, anterior or posterior, LL or PLL get lifted. They get ossified or calcified when you are dealing with dish or ankylosing spondylitis. Again, a little bit about ligamental phlegm. It kind of holds the facet joint together. It goes across the superior and inferior articular facets. It consists of yellow elastic tissue and it preserves upright posture of human being. So when you are getting up from bent position and trying to become erect, the human flavor comes into picture. It starts degenerating with facet joints as early as in second decade of life and at the age of 60 plus, virtually everybody will have facial arthropathy and ligamentum phlegm hypertrophy, pseudo hypertrophy. We will review the sagittal teeth images again to understand the anatomy. So, we obtain 4 mm slice thickness cuts from left to right. You can see pedicles of L4 and L5, the neural foramina, and the exiting nerves. This is L4, this is L5. Pedicle, superior articular facet of L4, inferior articular facet of L4, and this is the facet joint. Coming further medially, you can see the parts very well, the neural foramen and the keyhole like appearance. Again, inferior articular facet of L3, superior articular facet of L4. Coming further medially, at the level of lateralises, we are seeing fat in the lateralises. Because this patient's canal is nice and wide, you can see fat in the lateralises very well. Coming in the paramedian section, you can start seeing the spinal cord and chorus medullaris. Little bit of cord I1 and no roots, anterior epidural fat, nucleus pulposus, and nucleus fibrosus. This is bang midline, vertebral bodies, nucleus pulposus, annulus fibrosus, conus medullaris, cord eye panel nerve roots, posterior epidural fat, anterior margin of spinous processes. You will measure your canal over here. Going to right paramedial side, similar deformation, more to T2 added images, again Pedicle of L4, superior articular facet of L4, inferior articular facet of Q3, L4 5 facet joint, which is nice and bright because it is not here degenerated. Neural foramen, 
exiting now root L5. This is Batson's venous plexus. These are left renal artery and vein. Coming medially at the level of conus medullaris midline, cordaiquana now roots. These are coming out from cordaiquana and trying to exit through respective neural foramina. So to conclude, knowledge of anatomy is the key to precise understanding and hence accurate diagnosis.